This is a standard triumph effect. The effect begins with a regular deck of cards that is completely mixed. Uh, from that deck of cards, there is a process by which a card is selected by a spectator. Uh, that card is freely selected. In this case, the uh, Four of Hearts. Um, at some point in the effect and in the presentation, the selected card or cards, this may be done with more than one card, is then added back into the deck. And uh, through a process of shuffles or cuts, uh, that card is then returned and lost inside of the deck. Uh, and then after there has been a good uh, shuffling of the cards done, uh, there is a point in the story or in the pattern uh, that lends the magician to take half of the deck and turn it to the opposite direction. Uh, then the magician proceeds to offer one more shuffle uh, that is in this kind of manner where half the deck is facing up, half of the deck is facing down. Uh, the cards uh, may be presented some way to uh, demonstrate that they are indeed being shuffled, uh, maybe not. Uh, and then uh, the cards in this case are uh, uh, fairly and fully squared back together. Uh, at this point uh, the cards may be uh, cut and you can see demonstrated in the cut that some cards are facing up, some cards are facing down, uh, some cards are face to face in there, some cards like right here are back to back. Uh, and we have this kind of uh, messed up situation inside of the deck. However, in this one moment, we give kind of a magical pass and we check the deck to find that everything has been restored to the proper direction except for one card, which is the spectator's selected card. This is a standard presentation of the triumph effect. Hello, my name is Carl Irwin for The Common Magician, and uh, I'm going to uh, present to you a, a series here in one video, uh, probably be somewhat of a lengthy video, uh, and I'll try to also uh, indicate where different uh, portions of this video uh, begin and end uh, so that you can uh, jump to the right spot. Um, but we're going to look at uh, the triumph routine. We're going to kind of take a comprehensive look at the various popular common methods for accomplishing the effect. Now just very quickly I want to explain to you uh, what the triumph effect is. Uh, you, I'm assuming that you probably know what it is if you're here watching this video, but if you don't, uh, the triumph effect uh, goes something like this. You would have a card selected in some manner. Uh, in this case we've had selected the uh, ten of diamonds. Uh, and then the card would be shuffled into the pack uh, somehow fairly. It would be uh, lost in there, uh, lost away. And then the pack would be shuffled in such a way uh, that half of the deck would be facing uh, the wrong way so that it would look uh, something uh, something like this. So half the cards are facing up, half the cards are facing down. That would be squared up uh, along with uh, uh, that uh, selected card inside of it. Uh, and then you would end up in this uh, uh, place uh, where you would have ultimately in the end, let me set this up very quickly so you can see what it looks like. Uh, after all of the shuffling, you would have a deck that would look something like this. Uh, and the uh, magician would say, uh, you see that there's some cards that are facing down, but there's also a lot of cards that are uh, facing up and down. Uh, the pack is really in disarray. In fact, there's some places where cards are face-to-face -face or back-to-back. Uh, however, in this one uh, magical pass and in this one magical moment, you'll see that all of the cards have been made right except for uh, your selection. The Eight of Diamonds, I believe, is what we had. So that's essentially the effect. Now, what's missing here is the part where I uh, would shuffle the deck. I've left that out on purpose because that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the various methods and procedures by which uh, we shuffle the deck for a triumph routine uh, and we're going to look at the various procedures and methods by which we get out of that shuffle uh, or avoid that shuffle in such a way that it appears that it was shuffled when it was not and also uh, get to this point where the card is face uh, face up inside the deck. Now I just want to point out that there is a point at which uh, in the triumph routine you end up in this situation. Half of the deck or nearly half of the deck will be facing the wrong way, 
back to back or face to face, it could be the other way around, with the remainder of the deck. So you have half of the deck facing up, half the deck facing down like this. And if you're doing a single card triumph routine where you, you have a card selected, uh, that card typically is on top of the face up pack like this. So this is what the deck looks like. You will get to a point where it looks like this. Very few triumph routines do not have this moment in it. Um, I really can't think of one, quite frankly, off the top of my head that doesn't have this moment in it. Uh, so we're going to look at how we get to this. And then this moment is universal to all of them, uh, where you have uh, uh, the situation where you show that some cards are facing down, some cards are facing up, some are face to face, some are back to back. And then in this final move, we uh, translate the top packet that has the selected card on it so that it is then turned over. And what that does is it writes all of the cards then together and leaves the selected card in the middle. So that is the essence of the, the final moments of any tri uh, a triumph routine. Uh, we're going to look at everything leading up to that and the various ways that we can accomplish the effect so we can get to that moment in time. Just quickly, some brief history in the last a minute or so here in this introduction. Uh, the effect of triumph was first published according to Genie Magazine uh, in their wiki uh, entry on this. In 1946 by Di Vernon, he published the effect under the name Triumph, uh, although uh, that effect had existed before then, uh, as far back perhaps as around uh, 1914, uh, maybe even earlier than that, uh, the early 1900s. And uh, uh, the effect has essentially kind of worked the same way uh, all along. Uh, Di Vernon's method, uh, Triumph, was the first one that kind of gave a more universal method for shuffling the cards that a lot of other versions would follow thereafter. Um, there have been since many, many, many versions of Triumph. Uh, that seems like there's a new one all the time. Uh, th the strange thing about all the new versions is, is far far too often the new versions are really just the old versions that are kind of repackaged and rehashed and there's been subtle nuances uh, different kinds of pattern that have been applied to them uh, to achieve the effect or rather the you know per per the perception that the effect is a little bit different than it used to be but essentially there are only two manners by which the effect is accomplished and really only three modes in which it is accomplished. So the two manners are one through a false shuffle. That is a shuffle that is completely falsified. It appears to be a legitimate shuffle, but it is in fact not at all a legitimate shuffle uh, and sets us up in the position where we need to be to uh, do the final convincer move and then present. The second method is by a, a uh, nullified shuffle. So that is a shuffle that may be legitimate, but at some point, either uh, instantly through a move or systematically through a procedure, the shuffle, which is legitimate, is uh, negated, it is nullified, it is undone uh, to the point where we are left where we can give our final uh, convincing uh, imagery. So those are the two modes. The two, the two, uh, rather the two methods, the three modes are the ones in which uh, you can present the deck uh, either shuffling on the table, or you can uh, present the deck shuffling uh, through a riffle fashion in the hands, would be the second mode, or, or the third mode would be some other kind of mixing procedure in the hands, either an, a, 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 a more sloppy overhand kind of shuffle, or something called a slop shuffle, which we'll look at later on, where the cards appear to be mixed up in packets inside the hands. So uh, two methods, either a false shuffle, or a nullified shuffle, and then three modes, either a table uh, riffle shuffle, an in-the-hands uh, riffle shuffle, or an in-the-hands uh, mix-up of some other kind uh, using uh, packets to mix up. So um, those are the three modes and the two methods. We're going to look at uh, um, both of those methods and all three of those modes a little bit. Uh, this is by no, in no way uh, an exhaustive look, but it is pretty comprehensive. We're going to cover a lot of different ways that I can think of that I know that this routine can be picked up. I might give you a few of my own ways that uh, are not really done by anybody, just by me. Uh, and I'll give you also a few pointers. I will also try to include 
a number of links uh, in this video uh, to other tutorials that are more in depth uh, concerning some of these methods, uh, some of these shuffling uh, methods that you'll see here. So I'm not going to get into any great detail. I'll give a few pointers, uh, but I'll try to uh, point you towards some uh, better, uh, more uh, in-depth tutorials to help you learn a little bit more about each one of these methods that we look at. So uh, let's take a look at the uh, first uh, method. Uh, which will be some on-the-table riffle shuffles. The first method that we're going to look at is a push-through shuffle. This is one of the oldest um, uh, gambling shuffles uh, that you can find or read about. Uh, it is a full deck shuffle uh, that is a real shuffle, but then is nullified by a strip-out or a push-through move. So this is what it looks like. And then that would be the whole shuffle. Uh, if you look at it, we have everything in full deck order. We've got aces, uh, hearts, clubs, and diamonds, everything's in order. Now, that's not that impressive because you're looking at the performer view, and then if you look up here, you can see the spectator view. So you can sort of see what I'm doing. Essentially, all a, a strip out shuffle is, is that you're taking half the deck off the top. You're going to do an honest shuffle. Uh, relatively honest. Here's what I do. I put a block on the left down first, then I shuffle kind of blocky to the top. I retain the top card and I put a little block on top so it reduces the amount of surface tension in there. Uh, then the cards are legitimately pressed together but when you get here you're going to push them through each other kind of at an angle uh, and then pull uh, back on the card. So I'll put a tutorial link, a link to a tutorial that explains this shuffle a little bit better. I do a couple of nuanced things. I, I do this little move with my pink, er, my ring finger down here so it looks like a squaring action. So if you're looking at the top, you can see this looks pretty legitimate. Then uh, from here you would uh, strip out the uh, parts that are on one side and then the parts that are on the other side go on top. It looks like a cut. Okay, so we're just undoing what we did, and uh, again, everything's back in order. Now, how is this applied to Triumph? Well, in a Triumph routine, you would want your target card, the one that was selected, or cards, uh, controlled to the top. There's lots of ways to do that. You can do a double undercut. Uh, you can look that up. Uh, you can use some other kind of Hindu shuffle or something like that that gets it up to the top. Any kind of control that you want. Uh, you can use any kind of ambitious card routine control. So if you like ambitious card, pretty much any move that you can do in the ambitious card uh, routine is a great use of a control to get a card on top. So that's just something to keep in mind that there's other uses uh, for things that you learn. Anyway, you've got to get your card on top. Once you've got your card on top, the way that you would do this in a triumph situation is you would need to get um, that card in the middle. So what I did there is I did a triple uh, cut, that, which retained the whole deck. So it's a triple cut. You can find that in Erdnase. Uh, and then I did one uh, half deck cut, and I've maintained the break. So I'm left with uh, the bottom packet on top now, and then my uh, target card is here. This sets me up to do the shuffle. So from this place, I can then pull apart the top that I just put on the top, turn it over, and then I'm going to do my regular uh, riffling. Okay. Now, the fun thing about this is that I can actually show that the cards are interlaced uh, fairly evenly uh, by doing that, and that's a pretty good convincer, so people can see that. Uh, and then from this point, if you look up in the uh, spectator view, you can see what will happen. Uh, I'll, I'll push together just as normal, but I'm going to do my strip out. Now, I do one extra thing here. I'm going to take my finger uh, as I've squared up the deck, and I'm going to push the top card over, so it's now joined the other packet. Now, I'm set up in a discrepancy here. When I go to strip out, I would normally strip out, and I would put this on the bottom and put this on the top, but since I move that card, there's, there's a discrepancy. It looked like I'm putting the top back on the top again. So instead, when I strip out, I'm going to take this part, I'm going to bring it back up to the top, then I'm going to do a double undercut on the table. So I'll take half of the bottom, I'll bring it to the top. The fun part here is that it's showing a face-up card. And then I'm going to bring the uh, actual top back to the top again. Now look where it's left me. I have my target card on top of half of a deck of face-up cards. 
on top of half of a deck of face down cards. So I'm, I'm where I need to be. I can now finish out my routine. I've got some cards facing up, some cards facing down. Uh, some cards are face to face, some cards are back to back. Uh, but in this one moment, in this magical pass, in this magical moment, you can see everything has been made right and your card is facing up, yada yada. So uh, that's how it's done. Uh, you can use a push through or a strip out um, gambling false shuffle or nullified shuffle uh, in a triumph routine. Very powerful if you have a good push through because um, this looks absolutely legitimate from the front. Uh, you see those cards being shuffled together, pushed together. There's no questions that that's, that's what's happening. Uh, and you, you put that together with a couple of cuts and you've got yourself a pretty magical uh, procedure there. So anyway, push through sh a shuffle, a nullified shuffle on the table. Uh, regarding the strip out uh, push through method, uh, more, more so the strip out method, uh, if you have uh, the stomach of a jet fighter pilot, uh, you can try something like this. You have your card controlled to the top, and you go through with the regular uh, kind of shuffle scenario, something like this. You can show your convincing move, and then you can let them waterfall shuffle together. Uh, and then do your regular cut out, strip out, uh, and then you would bring the um, uh, bottom to the top and then do your double undercut. And that's put you essentially in the same position where you can show your cards facing up, cards facing down, uh, face to face, back to back, and then uh, get yourself squared up again where your, your target card is facing down. Now what's happening here and again, like I said, you have to have you have to have guts to do this. Um, what's happening here is you're going to do a convincing move with this little waterfall finish. So if we split out the uh, cards again, take the bottom out, uh, interlace them together as normal, uh, and then show it that they're interlaced. What we do is we turn them sideways, and we're going to do the typical waterfall, but we're going to do it sideways on the table. The goal here, I, and I've seen Richard Turner do this. This is where I saw this uh, the first time in a gambling demonstration years ago. Uh, what you would do is you would then let them fall together, but you put your hands so that they are not uh, a deck width away from each other. They're further away from that, so that as the waterfall falls down, I'll do it real slow, you still end up with a margin on either side that's covered. Uh, and then you would put that down, you would have to push over your top card uh, to the other packet, you do your strip out, you would put your uh, uh, discrepancy side on the top so it looks like a cut, uh, maintain the break, do the double undercut to get things uh, back where they're supposed to be. So anyway, it, it, that's an option uh, that you can try. It would take a great deal of practice and a whole lot of chutzpah to do it um, because you know you could always be in that situation where you do your waterfall uh, finish and things get stuck together. Um, there is an in-the-hands version of a waterfall. It's actually a couple. One that is a legitimate shuffle and then uh, is uh, nullified. And then there's another one that's a um, uh, false shuffle that we'll look at. Uh, two other versions that are much better and a little bit um, uh, not, not quite as risky as this. But anyway, it is an option. You can do that. Uh, that is a way to do a strip-out shuffle that uh, doesn't involve a push through. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you do it really well, it would look pretty convincing to do that. So, anyway, I just didn't want to uh, go by the strip out method without at least pointing out that one idea to you, um, something worth looking at. We're going to look at another table shuffle. This is the zero shuffle. This is the most popular shuffle used in a triumph routine. Uh, it is said to be the one uh, magic slight that has made its way from the world of magic. It was invented by Herb Zero, uh, picked up by Di Vernon and a bunch of others, and then uh, moved into the gambling world. And I don't know if that's really true, but that's the claim that's made. Uh, so it's a false shuffle. This is not a nullified shuffle. This is actually a shuffle that isn't a shuffle at all. It just looks like it is. Um, I'm going to show you the quick and dirty way of doing it, and then I'm going to show you the elegant way of doing it, the way that I prefer to do it as a shuffle, and then we're going to look at the triumph way uh, to do this, uh, which kind of borrows a, a few of my 
little nuances. So first of all, the quick and dirty way, the way most people do it, and um, the way a lot of good reputable people do it, by the way, too. Uh, Bill Malone does it more like this. Uh, the zero shuffle, quickly let me show you all the cards are in order. The zero shuffle uh, in one shuffle can be done like this, where you do a quick slip cut in the top, uh, you interlace together honestly, and then you push all the cards together like that, and uh, that's pretty much it. So that's the quick and dirty way, and you see that everything stays the same, nothing's changed. Uh, quickly, to show you what has happened there, uh, you can kind of see from the back side, and then you can see the performance view there. Uh, when you do the slip cut, you're retaining the top card where it originally was, and then you interlace together. Uh, I like to put a block on the bottom and a block on the top so that you have some uh, uh, cards to play with, and you have less, uh, particularly on the top, and you also have uh, less uh, surface tension there uh, so that you can de-interlace quickly. The idea is that you do that and then you give left hand cover uh, and then push over on the top block as you pick up and then uh, push everything together like you're collecting the cards together. So what this looks like with respect to a regular shuffle this is a regular deck of cards, not in any order, and this is a regular shuffle, is it kind of looks uh, like this, like you're just collecting the cards together. So it does look legitimate, um, but it is a little quick and dirty. Now, I have a problem with it. Here, here's what it is. If I want to do a shuffle, uh, a real shuffle, it would look something like this. I would put them together, and then I would push the parts together. That's what it would look like. Okay, so we want it to look, in my opinion, you want it to look more like that. You're trying to get that kind of a look. So there's a way to do that. So quick uh, on our short tutorial on the zero shuffle before we apply it to Triumph. Again, everything's full deck order here, I think. Yep. Um, I do a couple of shuffles and a cut. So it looks a little bit more legitimate. And actually, Herb Zero teaches this. Um, uh, now, I'm going to do a little bit more of a, a thing that I do myself. Uh, but Herb Zero does teach uh, multiple ways to perform this. This is one of them, a sequence. So what this involves is it involves actually taking the top off without the slip cut, because I don't like the slip cut. I think it's too much risk, too sloppy. Then we're going to interlace as before, retain the top card on the left. And then instead of covering, what we're going to do is I'm going to take the top packet of cards and push them out and forward. And I'm going to push forward the top card on the left. Now what it does is, from my view, you can see every, all the dirty work. But from the spectator's view, there's a whole bunch of cover from these cards on the front. So now I can deinterlace directly in front of the spectator, get my fingers out in front, and I've got a lot of cover to push it back together. Now it leaves me in a spot where I have um, translated my bottom to the top and the top to the bottom, and I've displaced one card from the middle. So what I have to do is I have to do this again where I pull out the bottom to the right, I'm going to follow through on the same pattern again, retain the top card. I'm going to push forward on these cards so that I get some cover, deinterlace, bring it all together. Now on this I want to maintain my break one more time because now I'm in a place where I've got my bottom, my original bottom is on top and my original top is on bottom. So which means I need to do one cut, which is something that you would do anyway. And if I cut the deck, now I'm actually back into full deck order. So that's how I do a uh, zero shuffle. So more at speed it looks something kind of like this. Okay, so if you're looking really close you can see kind of what's going on, but there's a lot of cover when you push those cards together in the front. It looks really obvious from this side, but from that side it looks it looks pretty good. I mean, if you're doing things smoothly, it looks uh, pretty legitimate. Uh, so that's the sequence. Now, the good news is that in a Triumph routine, we don't have to be so busy with it. Um, we can actually do this fairly simply. Uh, what we can do uh, is we can uh, get our card controlled to the top like we would intend to. And uh, we are going to mess up the order of the deck, but that doesn't matter in a triumph routine. Uh, if you want to maintain the full order, you have to do the sequence that I just showed you. In order to do the triumph, we don't. What we're going to do is we're just going to take the bottom of the deck and pull it to the right, turn it over, uh, and then we're going to go through with uh, the procedure just as we watched. So we interlace with a packet on top, push forward on the top cards, and then we're just going to uh, bring everything all together, much like that. And then we're done. That's all we have to do. We don't have to cut. We don't have to repeat it again. 
So one more time, this is what it would look like. We have our card uh, on top. And there's our card. Now you'll notice one discrepancy that doesn't really matter is that the deck is in fact uh, translated. It's transposed the bottom to the top and the top to the bottom. That doesn't matter in Triumph. Um, the only reason why this uh, would matter is if you were trying to maintain the full deck order you would have to follow that procedure that I went over earlier. But anyway that's the uh, zero shuffle application um, to a Triumph routine and the way I like to do it with a little bit of cover there. The next method I'm going to show you has become widely popular lately. Um, it's really powerful. But it's also extremely difficult to do. Uh, it is a Hofsons or spread call uh, move in which you are calling half of the deck. And essentially what the idea is is that I've got the deck really shuffled so that some cards are facing up, some cards are facing down. The spectator has selected their card, it's out there. And what you're going to do is you're going to demonstrate uh, uh, showing them that all of the cards are facing different directions. And as you're doing this, you ask them to just uh, insert the card. Now, I'm going to fumble a little bit with this because I'm doing both jobs at the same time. But you say, you know, you can put it in face up or face down. It doesn't really matter. So let's say the spectator puts it in face down. And what I'm doing is I'm actually um, undoing the shuffle. I'm uh, uh, employing a, a spread call underneath the uh, deck here to take all of the cards that are face down and then separate them uh, to the back of the deck while I'm keeping all the other cards that are face up in the front. And what I did is I took the spectator's card, which was face down, and I put it into the pack that is face up. Now, this leaves me in one situation where I've got a, a, a small packet of cards facing the wrong direction on top. All I have to do is when I demonstrate that the deck is messed up, is I can say I've got places where cards are face up, I've got places where cards are face down. Uh, you can see these different locations in the deck. There's even some places where cards are face to face and some places where cards are back to back. And then you do your transposition there. Now when I show uh, the deck, I'll find that um, in that transposition that I've got my selection in there. Now I'm not going to get into this very deeply, okay? Um, it takes a lot of practice to get to a point where you're doing this kind. It's not even my favorite version. We're going to get to my favorite version of Triumph um, because it requires a whole lot of time, really, right in front of the specter. Even when Kostya Kimlet does it, it requires a lot of time. But I will show you the basic premise um, because the basic premise of this is not really Kostya Kimlet's. It's just what he's doing with it is his own. Okay, the basic premise is that it's a Hofsons or spread call, and here's how a Hofsons or spread call works. Uh, we have a specific card in the deck, and I would be showing the deck to be completely mixed up, and as I'm showing that the deck is completely mixed up, uh, I'm, I'm doing some dirty work in there. I've actually taken the card that I want, and I've moved it out to the top of the deck. Now, the way this works uh, is... If you look in the mirror, way down here at the bottom, uh, as I get to uh, that card that I want, uh, what I'm going to do, if you look in the mirror, you can see it right there, I'm going to push that card in behind the card that's above it, which is the Four of Clubs, and I'm going to take with my fingers in the back and pull it out. So then I can insert all of the other cards. You can see that up in the mirror. I can insert all of the other cards on top of that. All you're doing in a spread call is you're partitioning off a certain card or certain type of card to the right underneath and putting the rest in on top. So if I were to employ this, say, for reds and blacks, uh, I would keep my reds on the top. I have a black card here, and then I'm going to call out the red card. And then I'm just going to continue to call red cards uh, out underneath the blacks so that I'm pushing the blacks on top, I'm putting the reds on the bottom, uh, and so on. And you can see uh, what, what, what this is doing for me is I have a section of reds here, I've got my blacks here. If I were to continue doing this all the way through, I would end up with um, with reds and blacks separated out. So that is the spread call, or the Hofsons or spread call 
um, application as it pertains to Triumph. Um, once you get down to that end, you're in a place where you can do your uh, reversal move once you have that uh, and get everything where it needs to be. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. It's a really, really great method uh, that takes a whole lot of guts. So have fun with that if it's something you're interested in. Uh, we'll move on. I'll show you a few other things that might be a little bit more accessible, uh, not only to you, but quite frankly also to me, uh, and yet to get to my favorite one uh, coming up. This is an in-the-hands riffle shuffle uh, that is a, uh, a nullified shuffle. It's not a false shuffle, but rather it's a nullified shuffle in that it's honestly shuffled and then it has to be uh, separated out, much like the strip out uh, or push through shuffle. Uh, it looks something like this. We would need to get our uh, target card controlled to the top, as, as has been the case. Uh, and then we would do a slip cut when we uh, cut the deck. So as I riffle off uh, the bottom part to cut it, I would normally riffle off and then cut a part to shuffle. But instead, we're going to riffle off the bottom, place the top, uh, the uh, thumb for the left hand on, on the top card so that I can slip cut out my target card. And then I would turn over my uh, other pack. I would honestly shuffle them together uh, and I would re retain the last card, which is the target card on the left hand, put the last block on top, and then whenever I go to shuffle, I'm going to give the I'm going to give the hands a little bit of a twist. So I'm going to twist my right hand forward, twist my left hand backward a little bit, and as I let them fall, the waterfall finish together from this angle. You probably can't see it very well, but if I turn in, you'll see the cards separate pretty starkly there. Now, I'm left with one issue when I go to strip these out. I need to get, just like in the um, push-through version, I need to get my target card over to the other pack. So I need to push down to switch sides as I bring it up. I reach over with my thumb, I grab uh, the uh, face-up cards over here, and then I grab with my thumb here on the face-down cards, and I swivel as if I'm swivel cutting the cards out into the hand. I drop the other pack on top, and then I'm left in my situation where I've got, uh, I can do my, my show of cards face-up, cards face-down, cards face-to-face -face and back-to-back. -back. I've got my target card here. I um, trans translate the top pack and then I'm left in my scenario where I've got one card facing up and it's the target card. And I have one more uh, in the hands false riffle shuffle. This is not a nullified one but it's actually a false riffle shuffle uh, that I prefer to do if I'm ever going to do an in the hands false shuffle, uh, one that retains the deck. This is the one that I do. Um, in the case of doing Triumph, performing Triumph, we don't need to retain the deck in its uh, full deck order. We just need to get things uh, translated back so all the cards are facing the right direction. Um, but it, this one is called the uh, Heinstein Shuffle. Uh, it uh, was created by Carl Hein. And um, it's a pretty, pretty novel way that he has to apply a very old idea and the old idea is merely the zero shuffle. So we already looked at that, which was an on the table false shuffle, uh, where we have some cover cards on the top or a cover card on the top, and we're just putting the top back on the top and the bottom back on the bottom. Uh, this is the same idea, but it's done in the hands and it's done on the waterfall finish. So um, uh, I do it uh, much like this. Uh, we would have our target card on the top. Just like on the other false shuffle, we're going to um, split off the bottom from the top and we're going to do a slip cut so that we have our uh, target card going to the left hand. We'll turn the deck over on this side and then we're going to uh, interlace them kind of in a funny way. It's more natural to interlace them with the front corners facing down on the Heinstein shuffle. You, it, you want to interlace them with the uh, inside corner showing. and You're going to retain that top target card for last, so you need to watch your angles here. You don't want people to see that card when you interlace. Once you're here, you're going to bring the cards. Uh, what I do is I kind of turn them to the left so they're not looking head on at this uh, picture. But when you go to do the waterfall, we're going to push forward on the top card, which is the um, cover card. Uh, the target card is now the cover card. And then we're going to de-interlace. I'm going to grab with my uh, right thumb, 
and then I'm going to bring the bottom part of the deck all the way in underneath and then I'm going to just riffle one-handed with my thumb uh, the top cards back on top like that. So that's kind of a really uh, sloppy presentation of it, but you see where we end up is we end up with our cards facing up, cards facing down stuff with our target card on top and we just need to transpose that uh, one packet and we're back to uh, where we wanted to be with our target card showing. Now um, this also will maintain the full deck order uh, the way it's done like this. So uh, just to show you what it kind of looks like a little bit without without the pausing and breaking in between we have our target card on top we're going to uh, slip cut off riffle together go to the side give it a shuffle like that a waterfall finish and then we can uh, show some cards facing up some cards facing down some cards are face to face and back to back as such and then we can show uh, the whole deck has been transposed except for that one card. So that is the Heinstein Shuffle. Uh, that is the preferred um, in the hands false riffle shuffle that I like. Uh, it's a, some people say it takes a whole lot of time to get it learned. It does take some time to learn it, but once you do learn it, it's, it's got a lot less risk in it. It really does because you're not really getting everything shuffled together. You're just, you're just doing an in the hand zero shuffle. Uh, and you're using the waterfall finish to your advantage. Uh, one quick tip on this, when doing it at a table like this, you can see the angles are a little weird. This is more of a shuffle you want to do when you're standing. Um, when doing it at a table, and I don't know how this will show up on uh, the camera here, uh, I, I like to bring it all the way over here to my left and kind of do the waterfall at an odd angle so it, the spectators can't see all the dirty work and also it gives you a chance to get the cards face more face down uh, when you bring them over to the your right and they're looking at the left hand side the reason why that's important is that in order to do the interlacing on the inside corners the cards are kind of sticking up like this and then when you go to do the waterfall they're getting a dead-on view of it when you're standing they can look at the top but when you're at a table, it doesn't work out so well. So you kind of have to bring it over to the left because it's a little awkward. I'm sorry, to the right, their, their left. Um, and then you're, again, left in the uh, situation you want to be in where you can, you can do your face-to-face, back-to-back business and then get everything uh, organized the way you want it to be so that your target card is then facing the right way. Okay, so that's the Heinstein Shuffle. That's uh, my preference if I'm going to be doing a false in the hands riffle shuffle that's the one I do okay this is my favorite one okay it's also the easiest one to do but it looks really really good uh, it is a false shuffle it is not a nullified shuffle it is also the uh, most elementary one so when I mention the name of this some of you are going to make a big mistake and you're just going to turn this off uh, because you've heard of this before and you're aware of it it's called a slop shuffle um, bear with me. I do it differently than most. Okay, let me show you the elementary way of doing it. I have four aces over here. I'm just going to keep those aside for a second because I'm going to use those in a moment. But this is the elementary way of doing it. I've got my uh, card that's been controlled to the top. Uh, you need to get the card to the bottom uh, in this case, so you want to control it to the bottom. Now, a way to do that is if you want to just do a, um, a overhand shuffle gets it to the bottom. By doing that it also gives the impression that you are going to be mixing up cards in the hand. You can even say, you know, some people like to mix up cards like this. And then the old patter goes, you know, and if you give it to a, you know, like a drunk guy, right, they might, uh, you know, do it like this. And, and if you know a slop shuffle, what I'm doing is I'm taking off little groups of cards and I'm just flipping back and forth. Now, if you look at this for any amount of time, you'll know what's happening. I'm really just putting half of the cards up and half the cards down. Now when I get to the very end, I have my last card, I put that one on top, and I can just kind of quickly show this, like it looks like it's mixed, but it doesn't really, okay? <laughs> and then I'm left in my situation where I can do my face-to-face, back-to-back shtick, uh, do my transposition, and then I'm left, um, as usual, with my card facing the wrong way. That's the elementary way. Let me show you the cool way. We'll get rid of that. This is best done if you have multiple cards.
Okay, so I actually like to do a trump triumph with four aces rather than just one card. Uh, and this really works best doing it this way. Probably doesn't work as well if you don't have this situation. I learned this from Costier Kimlet uh, in his Roadrunner call, but this is not using the Roadrunner call. It's just using a visual that uh, he presents in his teaching uh, that works well in this situation. What we're going to do is we're going to fan out the deck, but I'm going to fan. When I fan, I'm only going to fan uh, the bottom half to the bottom third. Okay, the top half to the top uh, two thirds is going to be uh, blocked up here in the top. I'm going to take the first ace, I'm going to put it in facing the wrong direction, only a few cards in. Then I'm going to go only a few cards up from there and put in the next ace, but I'm going to move it over. So the idea is that as I put these in, they're only a few cards away from each other, but they look as though they're spread out in the deck. Okay, briefly. If you look at this too long, it doesn't look legitimate, but that's that's what's actually there. They're really close. Then I'm going to close up the fan. I've got half of the deck to work with, and then I've got these cards just a few cards away from each other in the bottom. I start my slop shuffle like this. Okay, So this is the same old thing. Now you want to move kind of quick and brisk. You don't want people to stare at this. Now what I do is when I get to my first ace, I push it in. Then I want to turn it over and get the next one in a group of cards. Then the next one group of cards and the next one a group of cards and then I can finish this off like this and when I get to the last couple two or three I put them on top as a cover now look at this situation look at this picture I've got cards facing down I've got cards facing up I've got cards facing down I've got cards facing up I've got cards facing down I've got cards facing up I've got cards facing down this looks like it's legitimate if I turn it over I see the same kind of thing so I can show this a little bit more authentically because I have cards in there. These aces are in there, and they actually are facing the wrong way. Okay, so this looks pretty good. Now what I need to do is I just show that I've got some cards facing up, some cards facing down. I'm going to peel off the top few, put them on the bottom, then I'm going to square up the deck, and then I'm going to go on as normal. I can break to the middle, show that I have them back to back, do my transposition, and now look at where this leaves me. I now have uh, all cards facing the right way except for my uh, four aces. And as I thumb through, there'll be kind of a big block in the middle if you do this the right way. So you just push through those a little bit more quickly. This is better to show in the hands rather than on the table because you do see a discrepancy of about uh, two-thirds of the deck in the middle without any cards in it. But anyway, that's it right there. That's my version of the slop shuffle uh, that you can apply using multiple cards uh, and it looks really good and it looks like things happen instantly. It looks like everything is fixed right away. So slop shuffle. Uh, just real quick too, the slop shuffle can be done by uh, dumping the cards out on the deck and then picking them up and doing the same organization. So lots of applications for that. Slop shuffle, good way to go. These are some examples of uh, controls that can be used to acquire the spectator's chosen card and place it on the top. Uh, that is a prerequisite that you need in uh, completing the triumph effect, um, except for maybe a couple of cases where the shuffle might require you to have the card uh, controlled to the bottom, uh, in which case you can simply uh, perform an overhand shuffle uh, where you take off the top card and then uh, move it to the bottom of the pack. So, uh, let's quickly go over just some of these examples uh, where you can um, uh, control the card to the top of the deck. Um, probably one of the easiest ones, uh, one of the easiest examples is the Hindu shuffle control. Uh, there's a few ways to do this, but let's say we have the spectator's uh, chosen card. Uh, in order to get it mixed into the deck, we would set it uh, on top of the deck, and I'll leave it face up so you can see it. Uh, and then we would proceed to Hindu shuffle, which is a uh, over the hand sort of shuffle into the hand. Only on the first pass, when we drop the first packet in, we either would take the whole packet back underneath in a break or just the top few cards. Um, and then uh, we would continue to shuffle off until we arrive at that uh, spot. So it's, it's a version of the overhand shuffle that's just performed lengthwise. Uh, and it would look something like this. We'd drop it off, and then we'd drop off another pack, and another pack, and another pack, until we get back up to the top again. So um, it would appear, it would appear in motion as if we have uh, actually lost that original card into the deck somewhere, when in fact it is, it is still on top. Um, that is one control. 
Another control that you might use to acquire the spectator's card on top uh, might be just an overhand shuffle. So you would uh, take their card, you would have it selected, have it on top, flip it over, and then proceed to overhand shuffle. But you start with an in jog uh, and then shuffle off on top of that. And then you would pick up, retaining the top stock at the in jog to create a break at your first top stock. And then you would uh, shuffle off again fairly uh, until you get to the top stock and you drop it on top. So essentially it's the same thing as the Hindu shuffle kind of principle in two phases of shuffling and it brings that card back up to the top. So that's another one. Um, another way to do this might be to use an ambitious card routine type of move. Um, for example, I may have a, a selected card uh, chosen. It's sitting on the top and then I can cut off, swivel cut, flip it over uh, and do a push out and then what I'm doing is I'm going to uh, substitute off a card on top of that from the bottom of the deck. So I've maintained a break underneath it. I substitute that card off as I'm showing it. When I slide it in, I've actually set it, their card, to be second from the top, which is a place you want to be in ambitious card routines. Then I can take that top card and do whatever I want with it. I could cut it in uh, to the second packet, uh, cut that whole section into the other side. It, it, it looks like a very complex way of getting a card into the middle, but really what I've done is I've maintained my card on top. So if you kind of slow that down, you can see the mechanics of what's going on there. So th that's just uh, one way to demonstrate that really any ambitious card routine move uh, that would seemingly take a top card and then place it into the middle of the deck is a good way to control a card because it seems like you're losing something in the middle when you're actually maintaining it up here. Um, one that I really like, I don't mind sharing with you, I can't do it with a joker here, let's say that uh, they select uh, something like the Eight of Diamonds. What you would want to do is have their selected card on top, uh, turn it over and then turn the pack over and you can tell them, show them that they could have selected any other card in here, that all of the other cards in the deck are uh, completely different and they had their free choice but instead they selected the eight of diamonds uh, and then you can take their card off the top place it inside you can even turn it over and show it legitimately going into the deck right in the middle but in fact what i've done is i've retained the eight of diamonds on the top and this is this is how this works what you do is once you get a selected card uh, you turn it over and as you show the deck and give them some banter, some patter about how they could have selected anything, you select, you call out a card that is similar to the one that they selected. So let's say the Seven of Diamonds. Uh, I'm going to Hofsen's or Spread Call. You saw that explained earlier uh, in this video. That card out to the top of the deck and then I push the rest of the spread on top of that so that I get my a duplicate card, my seven stand in on top of the eight. Okay, and then when I square up, what I've done is I put my eight second from the top. And now I can take the seven, which is the duplicate, I can put it in, and as long as I'm covering the number next to the top corner pip, uh, I can sort of show this pretty quickly. And that looks pretty believable if it's a, a close number. Uh, and of course, there's some numbers you couldn't do this with. Uh, it's pretty difficult to do this with an ace if an ace is selected. Uh, some of the face cards can be done. You can essentially substitute a jack for a queen, or a jack for a king, or a king for a jack. Um, so those are kind of the ways that you can use the face cards. Um, but I can cover up the number and then uh, I turn it back over, slide it in. It's a pretty convincing move. Now I'm set to do my uh, dirty work in terms of the um, uh, false shuffle because I've maintained the card at the top. So that's another uh, way to maintain. Uh, and other ways to maintain uh, or to uh, retain the selected card on top that are more table presentation oriented is to use a false cutting pattern. So uh, let's say I have their card selected, I put it on top, and actually I'll leave it up. I can just use a classic Erdnay's triple cut. Uh, so I cut off the bottom third, I maintain a break above that, I cut off the next third, and then I just place the original third back on top again. So that's another way to do it. I can do the same kind of thing. I think I show you in one place on this video 
where I get to the, the top and then I just take packets from the bottom uh, and it looks like it's an up the ladder kind of shuffle. I throw it on top. If I leave the card face down, you can see a little bit more what this looks like uh, up to speed. So it looks lo looks pretty fair, but really what I've done is I've just uh, cycled the deck around and kept that card sitting on top. So uh, that's a good way to control. Um, you can control uh, by using some kind of a false cut in the hand. So you can do a similar false triple cut in the hands where you swivel off the top third, uh, swivel off the next third, retain back the original top third, put the middle in the middle, and then put the top back on the top again. And there's my uh, card. So lots of different ways to do that. Um, there's one, you know, one that I like to do. It's another kind of triple cut where you take uh, the selected card and you take off the bottom third and you turn it perpendicular to the top third, you take off the top third, then you put the bottom back on the bottom, put the top back on the top. What it does at speed is it looks like you're uh, moving the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top, but you're really just keeping everything uh, where it's supposed to be. Um, so that's another one. See if I can think of any other ways uh, to do it. Um, you know, just use your imagination. There's lots of ways to falsify losing a card in the deck. You can even use a very uh, basic old gambling move uh, that I learned a long time ago, uh, which is called, it's referred to as a tap cut. Uh, and it looks something like this, where you have the uh, selected card on the table. This would be good at a table uh, placed on the top, and you say, I'm going to cut it into the deck, and you do that. And for some reason, um, this looks pretty authentic to the viewer. It really looks like you're cutting the bottom to the top, but all you're doing is you're swivel cutting off the top, you're taking the bottom, tapping it against the top, putting the bottom back down, and putting the top back on top again. So um, if I have this with the selected card on top, um, you know, this, this looks pretty obvious what I'm doing there when the cards face down looks looks pretty fair so keep it simple don't make it too complex go for the more simple less flashy visual um, methods and uh, you'll probably do all right so that is retaining the selected card uh, on the top uh, and those are the methods that I tend to gravitate towards more again check any ambitious card routine moves those are those are very, very useful in doing something like this because they uh, allow you to, um, they, they, they allow you to perhaps make it appear as though you're putting a card very directly into the deck. Any way that you can get yourself in a double lift situation uh, with, with the spectator's selection uh, so that you can uh, show a, a, a double lifted card and then put it into the deck, that's a good way to control over the top, okay? Uh, so those are uh, my ideas. Um, you can use them any way that you wish. Uh, good luck with those. I'd like to uh, try something special here. I have a, a regular deck of cards, and what I want you to do is I want you to uh, select a card. Just tell me when to stop at any point right there, and uh, we'll take that card. So this is uh, your selected card, the Eight of Spades. I just want to make sure you understand uh, that you could have selected any card in the deck, you had your free choice of any card at all, uh, but you selected uh, the Eight of Spades. What we're going to do is we're going to take your card and I'm going to place it inside the deck. So right about here, we're going to slide it in very, very fairly, uh, losing it into the middle of the deck. Um, what we're going to do now at this point is I want to uh, shuffle the deck uh, a couple of times just to make sure uh, that your card is completely lost. Um, and, and I want to give this a really, really, really good shuffle. So uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to take the deck, and I'm going to take uh, half the deck, and I'm going to turn it over so it's facing the wrong direction. Uh, and then we're going to uh, shuffle them like this. You can kind of see the situation here. We have half the deck facing one way, half the deck uh, facing the other way. And then if we uh, shuffle these together, uh, you'll see that we have this strange kind of... Uh, pattern going on here. We have some cards facing up, some cards facing down, some cards are face to face, some are uh, back to back. Um, but it, you'll notice if we give a moment here and we take the deck and we turn it all the way around, something interesting will happen. You'll notice as we look through the deck that all of the cards have been made right again except for your card, which is the 
eight of spades. Now I know that kind of happened quickly, so so I want to I want to try that again. We'll uh, we'll take your card here. We'll we'll lose it into the deck. In fact, uh, why don't we pick a few more cards for a few other people here? Go ahead. We'll select one for you, and uh, we'll select one uh, over here for you. And uh, you, sir, you can get one. And uh, why not one over here for you? Uh, so we've got uh, four four new cards in addition to our first one. We have a ten of diamonds, jack of hearts, two of hearts, and a four of uh, spades. What we're going to do is we're going to take these cards. We're going to we're going to put them in the deck uh, in such a way that I can easily find them later. So I'm going to put them in just like this. Now I know what you're saying that this seems uh, way way too easy. That's that's pretty obvious what I'm doing here. But uh, we're going to make it a little bit more difficult. Like before, we're just going to kind of very sloppily take all of the cards in the deck and we're going to mix them so that some are facing up, uh, some are facing down. Some are facing up, some are facing down. Uh, really, really kind of a sloppy shuffle like this. So you see our situation is that we have cards facing uh, every direction all over the place. You can see that we have some uh, facing up, uh, some are indeed facing down, uh, some are face to face, and some are back to back uh, like before. Uh, but even now, if we take the deck, we give it one half turn, and then we spread them, you'll see what has happened, that everything has been made right. And not only have we found uh, our four cards, but we also found our original card as well, that eight of spades. Uh, only those selected cards have remained uh, facing up. And that is uh, triumph.